Paleo Runner Podcast is devoted to finding better ways to live, run, train, and eat. I'm your host, Aaron Olson. You can find more information by going to paleorunner.org. If you enjoy the show, please go to iTunes and leave a review. Search for Paleo Runner in iTunes and click Ratings and Reviews. You can also follow me on Facebook.com slash RunPaleo or on Twitter at RunPaleo. I wanted to take a minute to let you know about a product I've been using called 3Fuel. 3Fuel is a sports drink that gives you fat, protein, and carbohydrates to use as a fuel source. Unlike sugar sports drinks, 3Fuel gets absorbed slowly into your bloodstream to give you sustained energy throughout your workout. If you'd like to give it a try, you can get 10% off by using the coupon code 3FOLSON. Go to paleorunner.org and click 3Fuel at the top of the page. If you're listening through the podcast app on iPhone, click the link displayed on the app right now. My guest today is Dr. Sarah Buckley, author of Gentle Birth, Gentle Mothering. Sarah takes an evolutionary perspective towards childbirth. She advocates for what she calls an undisturbed birth and is almost always healthier and safer than a high-technology approach to birth. Sarah, thanks so much for being part of the show today. It's great to have you on. My pleasure, Aaron. So, Sarah, I've really been enjoying your book, Gentle Birth, Gentle Mothering. It's There's so much information out there um, as an expectant parent and trying to decipher what's right and best for our, our child. Um, how did you get into this whole evolutionary perspective or natural childbirth in the first place? Well, um, childbirth has been a little bit part of my background. My grandfather was involved in um, childbirth as a family physician. My father was actually an obstetrician um, back home in New Zealand. And so it was always around me and I was always kind of interested. And then I did my training as a family physician, obstetrician, GP obstetrician, we say over here. And that involved working in hospitals, um, supporting women, catching babies. And what I noticed was that the less um, disturbance there was around, like at nighttime, for example, the easier the whole process was and the happier the mum and the baby were and the more disturbance there was and the more interventions, um, the, the the more difficult the whole thing was. And you know, mums and babies just didn't have that beautiful glow that, that I'd, I'd seen in other circumstances. And then I was privileged to support a couple of friends having their babies at home. I have to add that my husband's sister is a home birth midwife as well. And um, so there, there were lots of um, positive role models, I guess you could say, you know, th- things that I could look at and say, yeah, that's what I wanted for my baby. So we chose to have our first baby at home, made a very well-informed choice about that. Um, and then subsequently, all of our four babies were born at home. And, you know, what I see and subsequently the work that I've done, the scientific work really supports that that model, as you say, that I call undisturbed birth, where if we get out of the way and let the hormonal orchestration flow, you know, for the vast majority of mothers and babies, that's healthier, safer, easier, more efficient, and not just with with um, labour and birth, but also with breastfeeding and attachment, because it's the same hormones that make birth um, safe and easy as possible, or efficient, as I say, um, that also, you know, optimise the beginning of breastfeeding, and and they're the they're the love hormones, they're the hormones that make mum and baby and anyone else in the room actually fall in love with each other in those moments after birth. And uh, that's how Mother Nature designed it. It's a great feeling, but it's really there to ensure that the, the, that the offspring are well cared for. And this is true of all mammals. It's a mammalian system. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I really liked in your book how you went into the hormones and how they change in the mother and even how they change in the father just um, uh, as you're expecting children. And that, that was that's so interesting how you really delve into the science of all this. Um, yeah, yeah, that's um, something I'm really interested in. And right now I'm actually finishing off a very um, detailed report on that called The Hormonal Physiology of Childbearing. So that'll be out uh, before the end of the year. And it's got all uh, mega science and that even more than, uh, than what you find in my book and uh, a lot of background. And really, the more you go into it, the more powerful the arguments are for, for not disturbing the process, for supporting the mom, supporting her body, um, supporting her in pregnancy and labor and birth, but not disturbing her. Mm-hmm. And is that a new book you're coming out with or a new um, blog or yeah. what? It's a report that I'm writing with Childbirth Connection, childbirthconnection.com, a US-based uh, organization based in New York who um, have a lot of fantastic information about pregnancy and birth and particularly oriented towards um, US moms making you know mainstream decisions and hospitals. It's not a particularly, it's not a home birth or um, based document, but it really is a, is laying out the evidence, um, not just for moms, but for healthcare providers that um, we can really do much better for mothers and babies and what we're doing now. Mm -hmm. So Sarah, how did we ever get to this point where we see a woman who's pregnant almost as having a disease? I mean, I I remember the first time we made our first appointment with the doctor and we went in and and it just seemed like it was this whole procedure 
procedure there it was kind of like looked down as my wife had some sort of disease and, and we need to check everything in in the most minutia of way as if there was something wrong with her how did we get to that point well i think we've invited medicine into the um that process of, of childbirth and you know medicine is really good at finding things that are wrong and 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 fixing them you know and and that's the thing we've gone down this very medicalized pathway and as you say it's really taking a lot of the joy out of pregnancy and that's a really key point that you mentioned because pregnancy is designed to be a joyful experience so when all these hormones that start to build up even from the earliest weeks are hormones of pleasure and reward and love and connection and that's mm -hmm. what we should be experiencing in pregnancy with our babies and then we enter the system as you say that that doesn't recognize those important hormones hormonal dimensions of child of childbearing you could say and that brings in a whole lot of tests and procedures and look some of them are useful and they, they're useful for some women but the problem is we've you know we've sort of advanced and made a lot of benefits to to survival for mothers and babies and that's a great thing but we're now looking more and more at the, at the less and less common things and we're screening women for things that are you know we're screening every woman for things that are really only relevant to very very few moms and really aren't going to save many babies and you know from my perspective what you're describing is is what I call the nocebo effect the unintended negative effect of of the medicalization of all these tests and procedures and I think we haven't begun to look at um, what the impact for the mother and the baby is for that. We know that stress in pregnancy is really harmful, and yet we're setting up these systems that do, you know, really can really stress women. Right. Yeah. I mean, doctors always see the worst case scenarios, so I think that's probably where their mind goes first is is to prevent worst case scenarios. But oftentimes those are so remote um, that it, it might not be worth getting stressed out about. Um, I, I think you're right, Erin. And um, you know, it's really about the normalcy of of pregnancy, labour, and birth, and you know, keeping it as a normal physiologic as I say process you know and really trusting and you know maybe even knowing more about what's happening in the mother's body rather than bringing in things from the outside and you know, I always say to women you know look look inside yourself you have all the information that you need your baby is in constant communication with your body and you know, ordering what it needs I, sometimes I say I call it hotel of the womb hotel to womb your baby's <laughs> in there and whatever they want they're ordering it you've got 24 24 7 room service you know if they want a bit more glucose and they you know to, for more growth they order that through the hormones that they create and um, you know your job really is to fulfill all those orders by keeping yourself healthy and happy and well nourished and that's the main thing you can do in pregnancy and as I said the thing is all of these tests and procedures really for the individual mother and baby the gains are very very small mm -hmm. you know for example the universal screening we do for group B strep you know it saves the lives of 700 babies a year you know it's just and yet every woman's being subjected to it with with the concern and the worry that that it comes because you know the other thing that the hormones do of course is they orient you to, you to the well-being of your baby so our job in pregnancy is to be concerned about the well-being of our baby but the medical concerns aren't, aren't helpful I don't think. Mm -hmm. Well you mentioned group B strep test there and that's one of the decisions that we're going to have to make in the coming weeks and from what I could find online uh, even women who have group B strep uh, the risk of their child actually getting a, a, a negative outcome from, from being infected with that is very low but still the outcome can be very bad when if the child was to get that. Can you tell, talk a little bit more about uh, what, what your opinion is and outlook is on that test? Mm, well, well, one model that I find really useful, and it's in my book, and um, also on my membership website, gentlenaturalbirth.com, there's a whole webinar on making the decision about group B strep. I know there's a model called B-R-A-I-N, the brain model. So you look at the benefits, the risks, the alternatives, what your instinct and intuition is telling you, and then what happens if you do nothing. And that's a really nice one to apply to this mm -hmm. to this decision about group B strep. I mean, I guess there's two decisions to make. One, are you going to have the screening to start with? And secondly, if you screen positive, are you going to have the treatment? So the benefits, as you say, are that you know if, if you if if you have group B strep, if you're if you're um, if you a carrier of group B strep, a pregnant mom, it can colonize the baby. That means it can get on the outside of the baby. That's a that's a chance. Um, and then there's a, a less chance that it'll get inside the baby and cause a serious illness. And it can cause you know it can cause serious illnesses for babies. That's for sure. But as you say, the chance of that happening, even for an affected mum, is quite small if she has a healthy baby. It's about one in 500 at the most. Mm. So, you know, that you've got to decide whether you want to embark on this whole procedure um, for that for that overall benefit. And, of course, if it's your baby, that is a benefit, but 499 women out of 500 are not getting that benefit. Um, so the risks of it, you know, and the main, apart from the concern that, that we just talked about, the nocebo effect, the other risk is that, you know, it's um, the treatment 
is to have antibiotics during during labour, and I think that's a significant risk because what we're beginning to understand is that the the mum's healthy flora, the healthy gut flora, what she carries in her intestines and gut, colonise the baby at birth, and that's the that's a pivotal moment in the development of the baby's immune system. You know, we're beginning to understand the importance of our gut flora now, um, our microbes. It's even been on the cover of Time magazine. You know, we, we're only ninety percent, we're only ten percent human, ninety percent of the cells in our body are actually external bacteria that live in this um, community with us uh, that are commensals, as we say in biology. So, you know, you're, you're going to disturb your whole um, bacteriological flora by taking antibiotics, and that's the flora that you to pass on to your baby. And we haven't begun to look at, you know, we, haven't, we don't have studies that look at the impact of that. We know that um, you know, antibiotics can, for example, uh, antibiotics in the first year of life can increase the risk of asthma and allergies, again, because we're disturbing that those um, innate bacteria, particularly the gut, gut flora. So you know, the main risk, as I see it, of group B strep and uh, treatment the antibiotics is to disturb the mother's gut flora that she's passing on to her baby. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, we can't say, I can't say this is what the impact is, but because we haven't tested it um, directly, but we can say it, it indirectly, you know, there's a lot of evidence that the mother's gut flora is is a contribution to her baby's lifelong health and well-being. So that's one of the things I, I talk about for pregnant moms as well. You know, you really get want to get your gut flora into good shape, you know, have fermented foods, take probiotics, um, get rid of any candida or thrush that you might have. So, you know, that's that's counteracting <laughs> that's counteracting that that advice. So the you know um, that's the benefits and the risks and the alternatives. Well, you know, some some moms have looked at what else can I do to get rid of group B strep. But what I say about group B strep, it's like a weed in the garden. You know, you can use a herbicide to get rid of it, but really, unless you change the the, the composition of the garden of your bacteria of your gut bacteria, you're not. It's going to come back again. So again, fermented foods, um, probiotics. You know, that's really the way to to get rid of group B strep. And at the same time to give your baby an advantage lifelong by optimizing the gut flora that you pass on to them mm. and the other thing is if you don't do that of course you know you, you can get rid of group b strep at 36 weeks or 37 weeks or whenever you do your screening but there's a chance it'll come back again so you know we don't recommend treat, treatment during pregnancy because it might it might have come back again by the time labor starts it tends to come and go you know unless we pay attention to the gut flora and so yeah, this is a this is, this is um, an area that really is just an evolution at the moment and we need need more research to so that we can say to women this is this is what you need to do to get rid of group B strep and optimize your gut flora but um it's like the cutting edge of of medical science at the moment mm-hmm. so that's the, yeah, that, that's an alternative i mean you, you know your instinct and your intuition your what what's going to be right for you and your baby is really important tuning into your baby and um, those things and of course if you do nothing then then that's the risk is you know one in 500 if you are a carrier and of course much much lower if you're not a carrier mm-hmm. you know that the, what you just said right there is, is really what I like throughout your whole book is you take a very broad perspective and you look at how you said you know there's also downsides of, of taking the antibiotics and, and a lot of times the tradition or the allopathic medical community doesn't look at some of the downsides of these interventions another example you gave in the book was ultrasounds and um, there, you you point out that they're really not uh, they are while they are routine they're really not medically necessary or or even you know prescribed by some of the top radiologists how did how did we get to the point where we're where we have to do an image of every baby that's in the womb well it's sort of gee whiz technology isn't it I mean it's quite extraordinary to be able to see the baby in the womb and I think we get a bit carried away with that as um, as doctors and, and as parents as well you know the thrill of see, seeing the baby or seeing a, an image of the baby um, you know it's one of those things and look, medicine is really um, full of these things where we bring in something and it seems like a good idea at the time, but we haven't really tested it. And, you know, when we're, when we're introducing something on a, such a huge scale, we really need to know that it's safe for the baby. And ultrasound has sort of evolved, um, you know, because because we can do it really. And it started off in the 50s and, and it started, you know, we were doing more doing routine um, exams by the, the early 70s. And we didn't really even begin to test it until the late 70s, early 80s. And those tests did show show there was some subtle differences in children that were exposed to scans and those were the randomized controlled trials done in Scandinavia in um, Sweden and Norway but the problem is that that, that even since then I mean those were subtle tests showing more um, non-right-handedness in boys exposed to ultrasound but those were much lower powered machines and the the, the duration was three minutes in some of those those um, in some of those studies and maybe 10 minutes in others so and we don't really know what these extremely high-powered machines are doing 
doing. You know, the 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 um the recommendations and the limits on those machines have changed. They're a hundred times higher than the, what they were then. And we know that ultrasound does cause heating. You know, if, I don't know if, if you do this in the US, but over here in Australia, we can go to a physical therapist and we have a sprained ankle and they'll put ultrasound on the ankle and you can feel it warm up the tissues. Mm-hmm. And you know, it's a different. You, you, there's all sorts of different parameters of ultrasound. That's so not exactly the dose that they give to the baby, but if you give enough of it, you can cause heating. And in animal studies, if you do enough ultrasound on a pregnant mum, you kill, you kill the babies because they get overheated. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying that applies to human babies, you know, in, in terms of routine scans, but there is physical changes in the tissue that happen with ultrasound. We can document it. It's you know, there's no controversy about that. Um, and the more you know, powerful the machines are, the more those tissue changes happen. And you have to say that that's true as well. Um, but we haven't really made that extra step to say, well, what does that mean for our unborn babies? And we don't have any studies from you know, since 1993 when those when the FDA actually changed the um, the the guidelines for the machines or changed the regulations for the machines to say that they can have a higher output um, as long as they display supposedly a marker of the dose that that the babies are receiving, but it's not really working and. Um, you know, we can't say that it's safe for babies. That's the thing. I can't say it's unsafe because we don't have the evidence for that either, but we can't say it's safe, which is quite extraordinary, really, when it's so common and so widely used and, and, and we're exposing every baby to it. And I'm, I'm not saying that it's not a good intervention in some circumstances. If you really need to know information, it's certainly better than the old x-rays we used to take. And, you know, if it's going to make a big difference to what you're going to do, um, then, you know, if you want to know if you've got twins or a breech baby and, and that's going to make a difference to, to the sort of care that you get or what what happens next then yes it's a good intervention and it can give useful information but to expose every pregnant mom to it with her expose every baby to it we really don't know what the effects of that are mm-hmm. and is that the same for the handheld dopplers that monitor uh, heart the heartbeat do those have the same level of um Ultrasonic waves. Well, um, yes and no. The, the when you go to have an ultrasound scan and um, you see the grey and the black and white pictures or the three dimensional pictures, even that's called pulsed ultrasound. And there's a pulse that goes out from the scanning machine, from the um, the handheld. Bit, and then it comes, then, then it, it goes out into the tissues and is reflected back, and then they build up the picture from that. And it's only in pulses, but Doppler is actually constant. The waves are constantly going out and returning, so it's more constant. But Doppler, Doppler is a lower, so say, dose parameters, you could say. So it's not, you know, it's not as intense as, um, you know, like a 30 minute, <laughs> a 30 minute, you know, um, morphology scan. But there is some, definitely some Doppler, some ultrasound waves going into the baby. And what I used to notice, um, when I worked with pregnant women um, was that when I put that Doppler on the baby, if there was room to move, the baby would move. Mm-hmm. So it made me think, hmm, there's something going on there. The babies don't like it somehow. And in fact, one study showed that even though we call it ultrasound because the, the sound waves are, you know, travel a thousand times faster than not, than audible sound. Um, one study showed that put, she put a microphone in the womb and when they shone the, or they directed the pulse, pulse, dot, pulse ultrasound at that, it, it made a loud noise. It made the, the 84 decibels like a loud train going past and um because probably because the the pulses are slowed down and through go, traveling through the amniotic fluid so you know that's a possibility is the baby actually being subjected to intense noise you know when when, when we fire ultrasound waves at them as um as some people say mm-hmm. we don't know we don't really know but you know I, I, the baby you know the baby's reaction is is a marker for me what is the baby telling us and there have been studies showing that babies move more when you put out an ultrasound on them what why are they moving more? Like, what's actually going on there? We haven't even asked that question. Interesting. Um, Sarah, you know, one of the things that you mentioned throughout the book is this undisturbed birth. And one of the most common interventions uh, as far as uh, disturbing the woman's hormones is administering Pitocin. And so often, um, pretty much everyone I, I know who's who's delivered in the past three months has had, they've, their doctors have told them that they've had to have, get Pitocin. Why is, tell, can you talk a little bit about the role of Pitocin in, in the, in the role of delivery? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll, I'll go back a step and we'll take an evolutionary perspective here. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if you, you look at how animals give birth, um, what an animal, what does a female mammal do when she's in labor? She looks for a, a safe place to give birth. Um, she looks for an undisturbed place. She may have members of her species there. You know, um, I, I, tell, I tell mammal birth stories in my lectures. So, you know, elephants have a circle of elephant helpers. Um, mice have a helper. Um, dolphins have a, a dolphin midwife. Um, you know, a lot of species do have other individuals 
individuals around them. So they're not necessarily, they don't go necessarily solitary birthing, but they find a place where they feel safe and they know there's no one around them, no strangers around them, no individuals that are going to cause harm to themselves or their baby. And that's really important because if you think about um, mammals giving birth in the wild, and this is true for us till not very recently, till quite recently, um, you know, it's, it's pretty dangerous out there. Like, you know, in labour, a, a, a female can't defend herself very easily, can't run away very easily, and then there's all the smells and the amniotic fluid and the blood and this tasty little morsel that comes out at the end that any predator would love to gobble up, you know, and the mm. placenta and everything. So, you know, you're very vulnerable. So Mother Nature designs a system to, first of all, to make sure that you find this safe, secluded place where you're as safe as possible. And secondly, to have labour occur as efficiently as possible um, so that that duration of exposure is minimised. So the hormonal system that governs us that we're talking about is the fight or flight hormones, epinephrine, norepinephrine, also called um, adrenaline, noradrenaline. So, you know, in labor, when we have a surge of those hormones, when we get a fright, when we feel not safe, when we feel anxious, we have a sense of danger, um, that can slow down our labor. It actually inhibits our contractions. And it also shifts blood away from our uterus and baby to those, puts it to the parts of our body we need for fight or flight. So when we're um, frightened in labor, it can slow labor down. It can also deprive the baby of blood and oxygen and these studies have been done in women as well showing that those things actually do happen when women have high levels of adrenaline epinephrine that their labor slows and their baby's more likely to have adverse fetal heart rate patterns so you know that, that sense of privacy and safety and you know if anyone's listening who grew up on a farm or has had domestic animals cats dogs you know in, in their home give birth you know that if you stay too close to that animal nothing's going to happen if you disturb that animal labor will stop and if you disturb it enough you can even uh, cause a mortality in the offspring and that's true in all, all animals and yet we haven't actually thought that that applies to women we're, we're mammals as well and we need to feel you know as I say private safe and unobserved in labor that's really important and if we don't you know if we if we if we don't have those conditions then our um fight or flight hormones go up and labor slows down or stops and if you think about the circumstances that we provide for women it's very hard for women in, in conventional maternity settings to maternity care settings to feel private safe and unobserved and often they'll you know women is especially in their first labor they'll find the smallest room they can like the bathroom or the shower and they'll huddle in there and they'll really try and and create this sort of birth nest for themselves because they know that that that's what's going to help their hormones to flow so you know, from my perspective the reason that we, you know, and when labor slows down, you know, um, the medical um, response to that is to get it to try and speed it up again. And, and pitocin, synthetic oxytocin is what's used. Whereas if we went a step back and said, well, what do women need for labor to flow, you know, um, as it's designed to, it would be to, to help them to feel private, safe and unobserved. And so, you know, when you have um, women laboring with a midwife or in a birth center or at home or with a doula, you know, any of those conditions where they're more likely to when they're going to have that support to feel private, safe and unobserved, then their need, their requirement for interventions is much lower. And sometimes I think about, I imagine those circumstances that we put women in and I imagine like a cat or a dog or an elephant trying to give birth in those circumstances and it just wouldn't happen. You know, I think it's a tribute to our human female bodies that any of us can can give birth in those circumstances. And, you know, the other thing is, of course, is, is patience. You know, sometimes labour does stop and start and, you know, we have this medical idea that labour has to go at a particular rate and that's what Pitocin is often based on. You're not dilating fast enough. But, you know, biological processes don't go in a straight line. You know, does your mm -hmm. baby learn to walk in a straight line or talk in a straight line? It happens in fits and starts. And that's true for progress and labor too. You know, it happens in fits and starts. And, you know, a, a patient care provider who gives a woman the space and the privacy that she needs, you know, will ha has much lower rates of intervention and generally better outcomes. Because the other thing with Pitocin, synthetic oxytocin, is it speeds the contraction actions up it makes them longer stronger and closer together and that can really stress the baby as well so um Lots of good reasons to avoid Pitocin, but I can really, you know, if you look at that big perspective, you can see why it's so commonly used because we're not providing circumstances where women feel private, safe and unobserved. Mm. So you mentioned there that it's often used to speed up uh, the rate of delivery. How much, how important is it to have your baby within 24 hours after uh, the water breaks? That's what we're often told is that if you don't have it within 24 hours, then uh, the baby is at risk for infection. Is, is that true? Well, there's lots of um, ways to answer that question, Aaron. 
And so I'll just go back a step and say, why did you, why do the waters break? Because generally in a natural labor, the waters don't break until, till the woman's almost pushing. They don't mm. break till the end of labor. And that's, that's really great for the baby. They form a cushioning. They form a cushion between the baby's head and the mother's cervix. And some older studies actually show that if you, if you break the waters, you cause pressure on the baby's head. And even, you know, the, the skull plates can move and even cause bleeding in the brain. And we know that's actually quite common in, in, uh, in really? modern maternity care to get, you know, when they sort of scan babies' brains, and I'm not recommending that, they have actually found a high incidence of um, um, hidden brain bleeds in the brain. And I wonder if that's to do with the breaking of the waters that, that cushion the baby's head. And it makes it more painful for the mother too. She's getting the ex- extra pressure on her cervix. And again, it's done to speed up labor, but, but there's actually not good evidence that it, that it does speed labor up. And, 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 it, and it gets the clock ticking. Once you have the, the waters broken, you know, the waters are hermetically seal the baby in and protect the baby from infection. And once you break those waters, um, things that are in the mom's vagina can get into the baby. And you know, there's usually... Um, they, there's usually you know, that's not necessarily a bad thing because as I said the mum's healthy gut for a colonize the baby but the trouble is in hospitals you have other things going into the mum's vagina like fingers to examine her like scalp scalp electrodes you know like it's not a good place for the mother's <laughs> vaginal flora in a hospital so mm-hmm. you know if you are in a hospital and your membrane's ruptured um, and it goes longer than 24 hours and that that figure's variable some places would say 12 hours some people's 36 hours um, you know the, the, the risk of infection does increase but it's you know generally it's infection that's coming from outside so you know in a in a different circumstance where there's not those risks to them to things getting put inside the mum's vagina you know maybe it's possible to have a longer duration of membranes being ruptured you know we again we don't have evidence on that but i know that you know low low technology care providers tend to have a, a, a more flexible with that timing mm. well sarah there's so much information in your book and you you present it in such a easy to read fashion but it also has all the references with all the latest research. And so I can go and look up those studies and, and actually know that this is uh, the latest research that's out there. So I really appreciate you writing this book. It's been very helpful for us. Where are you, what are you working on next and where can people go to find out more about you? Well, my website is sarahbuckley.com. So there's quite a few, uh, quite a lot of information on my website. I also have a new membership website called gentlenaturalbirth.com. And that's a great place to go if you're wanting information for things like group B strep. You want to know all about the hormones. Um, you want to know all about ultrasound sound. Um, I've done one hour webinars with PowerPoint slides that give a lot of background information about these things that are available free to members on my website as well. And um, you also receive a weekly video. So for pregnant women, that's great to know what's happening that week. And um, we're continuing to develop that and offer more resources. So that's a great place to get more of the sort of information that that I've been giving you today. Mm. Well, Sarah, thank you so much. It's been great talking with you. Uh, My pleasure, Aaron, and all the best to you and your um, and your partner and your baby. Very exciting. Oh, thank you. You've been listening to another episode of Paleo Runner Podcast. For more information, go to paleorunner.org. Thanks for listening.